Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Uh, today is a, is a sermon that I would rather not preach. Uh, so I start that. Uh, I, I want to start preaching a sermon that I'd rather not preach by saying this to you. Um, I feel like I'm your, your, your spiritual daddy. And I think that that is a very biblical perspective. The Apostle Paul used to speak in those terms to the different congregations around Asia Minor that he uh, planted and that he led. The Apostle Paul, he would speak to the church like he was a father. Now, now that is under the authority of our Heavenly Father, and that is uh, just like I am a shepherd, but under the, th the authority of our, of our Heavenly Shepherd, that's Jesus Christ, but under their authority... I then lead you and, and feed you and protect you. And so I, I, I preach to you today from the perspective of a daddy, not a coach. He, here's what I mean by that. Whenever, uh, whenever your coach says things that are hard to hear, you hear it from the perspective of, He's just trying to win the game. Or, or he's just out for the greater good. And so my coach is, is speaking hard words into my life because he wants to, to, to uh, achieve some greater cause. But when a, when a good daddy speaks hard words into your life, um, if you've had a good daddy, you know that, that it's because he's rooting for you. Because he has your best interest at heart. And he wants good to come to you. He's not just looking for greater good. He's looking for your personal good. So it's from that perspective that I, that I preach this morning's sermon. We're back in Genesis. Let's jump right in and, and read from Genesis chapter 12. If you would follow along, I'll read out loud. And It's a really weird story. And if you don't find it weird, you're not listening closely enough. And we'll just admit to one another, this is a weird story. And here it is. Genesis chapter 12, beginning with verse 10. It says, Now there was a famine in the land. So Abraham, he's actually still called Abram at this point, went down to Egypt to sojourn there, um, for there was severe, for the famine was severe in the land. Let me remind you that over the last couple of weeks, what we've seen is that Abram, who will soon, whose name will soon be changed to Abraham, Abram was called <clears throat> uh, to this new land, meaning that God, God said, you go. You go to this new place, this new land, which I will give you, and from your ancestors, or from your children, I will birth an entire nation. So it's this, it's this, it's the first high water mark in Abraham's life, where he's just getting by, and, and God says, here's the calling that I have for you. Here's a calling that I'm placing on your life. It's the first high water mark in Abraham's life. But there's an ebb and flow to this to this spiritual story of Abraham's journey, as we will see over the next few weeks and even months. So there was a famine. Verse 11. Verse 11. When he, when Abraham uh, was about to enter Egypt, remember there's a famine, he's going looking for food. When he's about to enter e Egypt, he says to, his, to Sarai, his wife, he says, wife, I know that you are a woman Beautiful in appearance. Now let's stop there for a moment. We know her to be about 65 years of age. Now in our mind, in our mind, we think uh, culturally, uh, you know, just the time and the day and, and the, 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 the scenario that we live in, we trip over that a bit. But she's a 65-year-old woman and he's saying, you're so beautiful, you're about to, to capture all the attention of this nation of Egypt. And, and what, we need to, what we need to realize is in that day, in that age, in that culture, the beauty was found in the eyes and the beauty was found <clears throat> in the form. And, 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 and she was, at the age of 65, apparently a super beautiful lady. Verse 12. 
When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. And then they will kill me. But they will let you live. Say you are my sister. Tell them you are my sister. That it may go well with me because of you. And that my life may be spared for your sake. So verse 14. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh, that's their king, that's their leader of, of, the, uh, of the nation of Egypt. When the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, Pharaoh dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, he gave, he gave him sheep and oxen and male donkeys and and, and male servants and female servants, servants and female donkeys and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me, Abram? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Verse 19. Why did you... Uh, um, I'm sorry. The second half of verse 19. Now then, here is your wife. Here's your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him. And they sent him, Abram, away with his wife and all that he had. This is the word of the Lord, um, Genesis chapter 12. So what we have today, there's really, there's really no uh, better way that I can think to, to summarize. What we have today is a story of Abraham, in a sense, prostituting his wife. Giving her orders which she followed, giving her instructions which she agreed to. That his, might, that his life might be spared that, so that he might receive a lot of goods and, and you know, donkeys and, and, and uh, uh, money and servants. And, and, and that's really what we have today. That is the story we have today. And it goes against everything that God set out for us as a human race in Genesis chapter 2. Remember in Genesis chapter 2, 10 chapters ago, uh, God said uh, a, a, a man uh, will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. God said that is, that is uh, prescriptive. This is the prescription for joy is that the husband will hold fast to his wife. And, and, and this, is, uh, this is yet again, early in Genesis, this is yet again another example of how perversion goes against the grain of how God has designed us, the human race. But there are many other examples in Genesis. I feel like today is a good day for us to talk about this because in Genesis, over the next several months as we continue to study, there are so many examples of sexual perversion, of going against this truth that God had laid before us as a human race. Uh, so Genesis, as we study it, Genesis should not be read thinking that these perversions that these stories, like the story that we read today, are the new standard, or are the new normal. They're not. They're perversions. That, that gut instinct that you have that says, that's not right, you should listen to that. Because that's not right. These perversions, that, the story of Genesis is this. Lest you've forgotten, the story of Genesis is this. The story of Genesis is a broken people 
who recycle their brokenness over and over again generationally of broken people who are in need of a Savior, namely Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you, is that not our story? Uh, is that, is, isn't that our story as well? We are a broken people who recycle our brokenness generationally. We pass it down to our children, then they pass the brokenness down to their children, and we are a people in need of a Savior. And that's the story of Genesis, and that's the story of my life, in your life. So sexual, sexual sin, sexual perversion is not a new development. I mean, it would be silly for us to even think that it might be. Obviously, it's, it's old, like as old as the ages. And so I probably shouldn't be surprised. I'm not even that old. I probably shouldn't be surprised that sexual perversion is a part of the church as well. But I always am. And we can say things like we live in a new era or times have changed or, 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 or whatever. And that would, be, that would be true in a sense. We do live in a new era and times have changed. Uh, and, and sexual perversion is the norm in our culture. No doubt about that. But that's not really new, is it? I think if, if there's anything that has changed in my lifetime, maybe just a little bit, is that sexual sin has become a bit more of the norm in the church. It's a little bit more accepted. And I suppose that happens by degree from one generation to the next. But it, it ought not be. Things have changed, but God has not changed. So I want to just briefly, <laughs> quickly is maybe the better word. I want to quickly... Um, Make the overwhelming case, I believe, that the Bible unequivocally commands us to flee all forms of sexual immorality. I want to make that case, but then mostly what I want to do is I want to give you an antidote. I want to encourage you going forward. But lest, lest we're unsure of what the Bible actually says, let's take a brief but quick and thorough Look, the Bible, the New Testament has much to say, is my point. Much to say about sexual sin as it relates to the Christian. Those of us who have committed our lives to Christ. If you think that, you're, that your sexual sin, um, maybe it's the pornography that you have engineered into your life in such a way that you think you're untouchable and and. Your, uh, your, your spouse uh, or your friends will never figure it out. Or, or if you think that your sexual sin, uh, the fact that you're, you're having sex with your, uh, with your girlfriend or, or the, the affair you have with someone, that you're having with someone other than your spouse. If you've come to believe that the Bible doesn't speak much about that, then you're, you're wrong. 1 Corinthians 6 says this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now if we, if we can pause there, we're going to read verse 11. It's a clarifying verse, but it, if we can pause there for a moment. And, and you might say to me, well Randy, then, then none of us will get into the kingdom of heaven. None of us will, 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 will the, the bar is too high. None of us will enter the kingdom of God. 
Because in this very room, there are, there are thieves. There are the, those of us who have stolen. And there are those of us who are swindlers. And there are those of us who are, who are greedy. And, and, and I'm sure there are drunks in this room. And there are the sexually immoral in this room. So what's the point of this passage? The point of this passage is Paul is saying, that's the way we used to be. That's the way we used to roll. But Christ has saved us from that. Christ has rescued us from that. Let's look at verse 11. It says this, As such were some of you. You used to be that. That's, that's how you used to live. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Let's look at Ephesians 5. It says this, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ in God. Colossians 3 says this, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, covetousness which is idolatry. And if we went on and on, which we won't, sexual immorality is mentioned 42 times in the New Testament. The, the most common word used for sexual immorality in the New Testament, the Greek word is porneia, P-O-R-N-E-I-A. But don't, don't read from our modern day English back into the language, back into the biblical language and say, oh, it must be talking about pornography. No, there's obviously simil similarity in those two words, uh, our modern day word pornography and this Greek word. But porneia in, in, in the New Testament, it's, it, it means anything, anything, out, uh, any sex outside of marriage. One of our distinctives at River Church is that we preach grace. And then we say God is a God of grace. And, and we, we say that, that, that if you are a, a son of the living God, then you are forgiven. And if you are a daughter uh, of, of the living God, then, then the old has passed away and the new has come. And you are a new creation in Christ. And you are no longer condemned. No one can condemn you. And... We, we preach grace here at River Church. And God is a God of grace. And what I want you to hear is, you have nothing to fear if you're a child of God. But today I must warn you, I must warn you, don't reverse engineer God's grace into your life. In other words, don't say, I'm going to choose to sin because I know God is a God of grace. I know He will forgive me. That is a, that is a deadly mindset. In love, I must warn you that, that, that to presume on God's grace in your life can lead to serious sinning. And your serious, premeditated sinning it brings eternal consequences. Hebrews 10, let's read that. It says, For if we go on sinning deliberately, probably a more accurate word there, English word would be willingly. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins. But a fearful expectation of judgment. And a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. My gosh, what in the world does that mean? Doesn't sound good, does it? I must shoot straight with you as your pastor, as your spiritual daddy in a sense. The danger 
you are exposing yourself is the danger of hell itself. Now, you would ask, Randy, are you saying that I can lose my salvation if I commit some certain type of sin or I, or I commit that sin over and over again? And, and I would say, and I would say, no, I, I'm not saying that you can lose your salvation. You didn't gain your salvation. That was an act of God's grace. You can't lose that. So what am I saying? I'm, I'm really just reading Hebrews, and I believe Hebrews says this. Willful, deliberate, premeditated sinning is so incongruent with the life of the Christ follower. It so doesn't align itself with the life of a Christ follower that it, it may be evidence that you, in fact, are not a Christ follower. What we're talking about today is not the age-old struggle with sin that every one of us in this room battles each and every day. Every one of us. We battle against the lust of the flesh and, and, and the lust of the eyes and, and the pride of life. And every one of us, we struggle. Remember, it was the Apostle Paul himself who said this, I do the things that I do not want to do. What's he talking about? He's talking about sin. The Apostle Paul himself, who wrote most, mo, much of the New Testament, he says, I, I get up in the morning and, and, I, and I sin, and I'm like, oh, I didn't want to do that. I was trying not to do that, but I just fell flat on my face. I need you, Jesus. I need you today. Okay, that is the struggle that is the struggle against sin that every one of us as Christ followers fights. And it, it includes the struggle against sexual sin. What Hebrews is talking about is a willful, happy, deliberate, premeditated act of sin. Actually, I said that the word deliberate could... could potentially be more accurately uh, interpreted as, as willing, or translated rather as willing. And here's one of the reasons I say that. The same word, the same Greek word is found in, uh, in 1 Peter 5, 2. We're not going to project it, but we're not going to project the 1 Peter passage. But, but you, remember, uh, you remember this passage in, in 1 Peter, it, it goes something like this. Shepherd his flock willingly. Not out of a sense of compulsion. Okay, that's, that is a positive use of the word deliberately or willingly. Uh, it's saying that when a pastor, uh, when a pastor is, is pa Peter's apparently saying, look, when you are a pastor, don't do it begrudgingly or don't do it like for money or, or for obligate, out of obligation. Don't, when you pastor a church, don't do it like for some other reason, like because you want to get credit or you want to, you know, prop up your own name. He says, when you do it, when you, when you shepherd the flock, do it willingly, like, like happily. Like you want to. Like a soul feeding sort of act. Okay, that is the word, willingly. And then in Hebrews, it's using the same exact original word. And it's saying, when you sin like that, you just run toward it. In a deliberate, premeditated, joyful sense. The writer of Hebrews is saying, if that is the way that you sin... There should be concern for your soul. Romans chapter 8 says this. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. What is, what, is, what is Paul saying? Or he's, saying? he's saying you should kill sin, right? That's what it means to put sin to death. Now, you don't kill friends. If your sin is your friend, 
You will not kill it because you don't kill friends. Nobody does. You kill enemies. So sexual immorality is your enemy. So let's, talk, let's, let's, let's spend the rest of our time together this morning talking about this. How to kill sexual immorality in my life. Number one. Number one, I encourage you to celebrate the new you. What does that mean? Uh, celebrate the new you. Here's what I mean. According to the Bible, the new you is someone who is no longer a slave. Paul says in several, in several instances, you used to be a slave to sin. You used to have to sin. Look, do you remember those days? Especially if you didn't come to Christ until like later in your adult years, then, then you probably remember those days where it was like you couldn't help yourself. I mean, you, you, had, you, had, uh, you had some interest in, in, in doing good things and, 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 and helping people out. But for the most part, when it came to sinning, it was you were a slave. Like you said, ah, I don't want to do that. And you would do it anyway because, because according to, it's a Christian ethic. It's a Christian teaching that people that are not Christ's followers, you're a slave to sin. And Paul says, that's what you used to be, but no longer. That old you is dead. The new you is alive, and so we celebrate the new you. Romans 6 says it this way. We know that our old self, that's the self that couldn't help itself. Remember that self? The, the old self was crucified with Jesus in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we are no longer enslaved to sin. You know what that means? I get, I get pushback on this sometimes, but I really do believe this. It means that you don't have to sin anymore. You don't have to sin anymore. It means, it means that, that when you sin, you choose to sin. It means that you're making a choice. It didn't used to be a choice. Like, don't, don't judge the old you and be like, man, I was a terrible dude. No, you were, just, you were just dead in your sin. And a dead man has no power. But guess what? Now you're alive in Christ. The new you is no longer a slave to sin. Sin is a choice. It didn't used to be a choice, but now that's no longer the case. Celebrate that. Number two, as we celebrate the new you, number two, celebrate Christ in you. Celebrate Christ in you. Galatians 2, really, really famous passage if you're not into memorizing scripture, but you're thinking about starting, this would be a great place to start. It says this, I have been crucified with Christ. When Christ went on the cross, he paid the price for your sins. You didn't. He did. But in another sense, when he was crucified, you were crucified. Meaning, it is no longer I who live. It's Christ who lives in me. It's no longer my passions and priorities. Now it's Christ's passions and Christ's priorities. And, I, and, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The good news is this. Christ now lives in you. Celebrate that. Celebrate Christ in you. That, what does that mean? That means that everywhere you go, Christ goes. Scary thought. Scary thought. Everywhere you go, Christ goes. And you drag Christ into the gutter when you go there. Number three. Rebel against the lie of sin. What is the lie of sin? Don't answer out loud, but what is the lie of sin? It's pretty simple. The lie of sin says this. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. 1 Corinthians 6 says this. Flee. 
flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. I only gave you the first part. You are not your own. You're not your own. You were bought with a price. The, 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 the lie, the lie of sin is, it's not that big of a deal. The truth of Scripture is this. There is a uniqueness to sexual sin. And I believe Paul teaches in several ways that, 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 that sexual sin is unlike any other sin. There's a uniqueness to it. There's a sense of it being so personal to the degree that Paul says every other sin is outside the body. But this, it's, it's and it's not just talking literal, it's talking figurative. It is, it is at the core of who you are. It, 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 it pulls, it tugs, it, it changes who you are at the very core, the very fabric of who you are. And the lie, ironically, the lie, the lie that we, that we uh, fall prey to most often is, it's not that big of a deal. Rebel against that lie. Number four, do not plan to sin. And if you're in the middle of planning sin right now, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Do not plan. In other words, do not equip yourself for sin. This is the biggest tripping point that I see in a lot of people's lives. You'll tell me that you do not want to sin and yet you, you haven't changed your patterns, the places you go, you are continuing to equip yourself, planning to sin. Romans 13 says this. Let us, not, let us walk with decency as in the daylight. Not in carousing and drunkenness. Not in sexual impurity and promiscuity. Not in quarreling and jealousy. Verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and it says, Make no plans to satisfy the fleshly desires. Let's talk about that. What does that mean? How do we make plans to satisfy the fleshly desires? And, and you know, if I, can just, if I can just chase a rabbit for, for a moment. As I was planning this sermon this week, as I was planning this sermon this week, I thought, as I normally do, like I should tell some stories from all my years um, of, of, uh, of being a pastor. But, but frankly, my stories are so gut-wrenching from all my years of, of, of leading, leading churches that I don't even want to tell the stories. And I thought, well, I could give in the way of examples, but I, I don't think you need examples. I think that, that it only fuels the fire of our imagination. And so... Today we just kind of talk about the facts. And, 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 and so, but I, I need to give a little bit of example in this case. What does this mean that we should make no plans to satisfy the fleshly desires? How do we plan to sin? Well, one of the ways is the places that you go. The places that you go literally, like you walk there, you drive there, you visit those places, the places that you go. If you say that you no longer want to sin in that way, but you don't change the places that you go, literally, physically, then you're planning to sin. But there is another, there is another way in which we plan to sin, and that is the places that you go virtually. With your... With your TV screen or your, or your computer screen or your, or your telephone. 
And the Apostle Paul says to us, don't make plans. Don't, don't lay it out. Don't, don't wake up in the morning and think, you know, I, I can do that or go that place or look at that thing and, it, and, and yet still resist the temptation to sin. You have to push away from that. You have to change your patterns. Number five, celebrate the Holy Spirit in you. Celebrate the Holy Spirit in you. See, that's the difference between being a dead man and being alive in Christ is that now we have the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's why we actually can resist sin because we now have the Holy Spirit in us. That is God in you, living in you, empowering you. It's all over the New Testament, uh, it being the description of how the Holy Spirit works in your life. But, but, but Galatians 2 specifically says this. That, that when the Holy Spirit moves into your heart, you obtain or you receive what's called fruits of the Spirit. Fruits of the Spirit. It's kind of a fruity word. But, but, but the Holy Spirit gives you fruits of the Spirit. And they're things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. I'm going to tell you another one here in a minute. But, but, but the idea is that when, once, you, once you become a Christ follower... And you receive, for instance, the fruit of the Spirit called peace. And, and all of a sudden, or, or, and patience. And all of a sudden you say, wow, I didn't used to be a patient guy. Like, given, to, given, uh, given my own natural tendencies, I'm not a patient guy. I, I, I always chew people's heads off. I'm always at the, at the stoplight or at the, at the line in Walmart or wherever. I'm a very impatient guy. But now, now I see the Holy Spirit working in me supernaturally because now I have this, the fruit of the Spirit known as patience or peace and patience. Okay, with that, with that understanding that the Holy Spirit in us we receive fruits of the Spirit. One of the fruits of the Spirit that I have not yet mentioned is this. Self-control. Self-control. Now I believe if we look at our lives and there is a complete absence of the fruits of the Spirit, that should concern us. That should, that should give us pause. And so... So if you are a Christ follower, then one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. And so if you have no self-control, what you have to ask is, what does that mean? Should that concern me? And you have to do some soul searching. And you have to pray, God, if the Holy Spirit is real and alive and active in my life, then give me self-control. And then what do you do? You celebrate the power and the presence of of the Holy Spirit in your life. Number six. Celebrate the power of community. You can look this verse up later. We're not going to read it. But Hebrews um, 3 verse 13. It says, it says this. It says that we should exhort one another daily. The church. What is that word, exhort? We don't really use that word. It means this. We should urge and encourage and warn one another on a daily basis. So like I have the other three elders. We're a church that's led by four elders, pastors. I have three other elders who speak into my life on a regular basis. I have men, a couple of men in Texas at other churches, they, 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 they pastor other churches, and I call them when I have problems. Uh, really, three other pastors. I, I've, I've been in touch with all three of them this week, asking them to speak into my life. Because we are encouraged to live in community. And my community, most, most closely, are the, the, the elders here at River Church. But then I've got three other pastors that, that I know well, and they know me well, and, and, and I live in community community. And, and this verse says that on a daily basis we should be speaking into one another's lives. On a daily basis we should give one another permission to speak into one another's lives. You know what the biggest hurdle to that is? Pride. We say nobody's going to tell me what to do. Self-control. 
celebrate the power of community. Daily, we as a community, we together, we fight against the lie of sin. Together, daily, we as as the community of faith, we fight against the deceitfulness of sin. I want to encourage you, you youngsters, you teenagers, you, those of you that are still in school, I want to encourage you to, to, to celebrate the power of community, meaning your family, meaning talk to your parents. You're like, no way in a million years am I going to talk to my parents about that kind of stuff. Talk to a friend. Talk to those in authority over you. Here's what you do. You find someone who's not going to judge you but is going to help you. And you talk to them. We preach grace here. We don't preach judgment here. We preach grace. So you find somebody that you can trust. Someone who won't judge you but will help you. And celebrate the power of community. That's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about in chapter 3. If you aren't in community here at River Church, you, you just come on Sundays, but you're not in a gospel community, which is what we call small groups, man, I encourage you. I would tell you that the significance and the importance of that is, is in my, my opinion, even greater than Sunday morning commitment. Because it's in that smaller community where you'll really talk and you'll really be heard and you'll really listen and you'll really find support. So, so if, you, if that's you, you want to get into a gospel, gospel community, it's a new year and you want to give it a try, then you put that on your, communi- on your uh, connection card today and turn that in and, and we'll make sure and get you into a gospel community. Over the next several months we're 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 starting a pilot group and then we're going to be launching some new groups um the overall uh, um, uh umbrella title is is rooted and it's a new uh, it's a new movement a new experience that we're going to have with our gospel communities and so it's a great time for you to sign up and and get into in 2019 get into a gospel community pattern that i've seen a pattern that i've seen too many times I've seen it at River Church, but I've seen it all my adult life as I've shepherded churches. A pattern I've seen too many times is, 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 is this. You start considering uh, a sin. You, you decide that you want to sin in a certain way. And then you disappear. All your friends, you're not talking to your friends anymore. I ask how you're doing and, and nobody really knows. Because when we decide to sin, we run from community. Because in, an, in isolation, we tend toward sinfulness. And in, in community, we tend toward righteousness. And in, in isolation, we tend toward brokenness and sin. Last, last thought on how to be killing sin, and specifically sexual sin in your life is fight like a fighter. That sounds like a sounds like a sounds like a, a song. But fight like a fighter. Uh, here's what I mean by that. You can write this down and look it up later. In 2 Timothy 4 7, the Apostle Paul, he's talking to a younger man in Timothy and he says, look, this is how you live the Christian life. You run a race like you want to cross the finish line. You 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 box like you're really trying to hit your opponent, not just trying to throw punches in the air. You, you race like, like there's something, some prize that you will win at the end of the race. And that's how we fight sin. Why is that significant? Because I believe that there is this ethic, this teaching throughout the Bible and, 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 and especially Especially in the New Testament, there's this ethic, this teaching which says this. You run the race that God has laid before you. You be about killing sin all your life. You finish the race and God has great reward for you in heaven for eternity. 
So, so fight sin not like you're a wimp. Not like you're a spiritual wimp. But like you're a champion. Like you're a victor. Like you're an overcomer. Like, like, you can, like you can finish this race that you've started. Because you can. I've read other good pastors say something this week. And I believe it to be true. And that is this. The root. The foundation. Of sexual sin. Is pride. It's. It's pride that, that causes me to think too highly of myself. It's pride that causes me to think I can't really confess my sins to anyone because then you'll think less of me. It's, it's pride. We, we tend to think that the, the root of, of sexual sin is, is our urges. But you know what? You can control your urges. The root of sexual sin is really pride. And the most powerful weapon against sexual sin is humility. It's admitting a need. It's, 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 it's talking to a brother or sister in Christ. It's, it's laying yourself low so that Christ might make much of you. I want to end with a dose of God's grace. I've tried to speak much of that today. And I want to say, if you are, if you've been a total failure, if you've been a total failure in this area of your life, recently or, or for a long time, or you, what I, want, what I want to say again to you is that there is, there is grace and forgiveness to be found in Jesus. There, there, is, there is grace and forgiveness. I invite you to to come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Let's pray.